what I need to do. You can do more in my waiting than I can do in my doing. Lord, today you know what I need to do. You can do more in my waiting than in my doing I can do. Well, amen and amen. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you here to Hanfield United Methodist Church here on Sunday, the Lord's Day. I trust you're glad to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, um, it is good to be back with you today. As we are, um, as we are, uh, as we're gathering this morning, I just spent the last probably eight nine days at uh, at a camp meeting in Michigan. I was a youth evangelist there, and so I was telling somebody this morning that I, I felt like a real Methodist uh, preaching at a camp meeting. I've been faking it this whole time, but now. Um, preaching at a camp meeting. I was like a real Methodist. So, uh, and it was, it was an excellent time. And I, I was telling somebody else, like, I'm, I'm both simultaneously super exhausted and also pumped up at the same time. How does this work? I don't know. I don't know. Um, so uh, today, before we begin our worship service, I would just want to highlight a few announcements. Um, first, I'd like to say, if you, if you see the, the red books on the end of the aisle, uh, I'd like to make sure that you have the uh, opportunity to fill out some information, fill out your, fill out information, register your attendance here, and then, um, uh, you know, if, if you're visiting with us, we want to especially welcome you and uh, make sure that you fill that out and, and put your contact information in there that you would like us to have, and then we can make uh, contact with you and you can uh, be more aware of all the things going on in the life of the body and the opportunities we have both to serve and to grow here at Hanfield. Um, I want to highlight just a few things that are in the uh, email newsletter, which again, if you don't receive the email newsletter, just make sure make a note of that in the, uh, in the, the uh, attendance pad. And we can make sure you get signed up for that. It usually comes out every Friday we, just with some the different things that are going on in the life of the church. I want to highlight a few of those. Uh, one would be, if you see on the front, there's a big front page there. We have a pretty a strong connection with Allen Elementary, as many of you are aware. And um, one of the things we do for them every year is to... Uh, uh, purchase school supplies and drop them off. You saw the display out there and in the entry hallway, um, and you see the different lists of school supplies that they need that they can have on hand. So um, I want to make sure that you ha- see that and, and can, can purchase some things on that list and bring them out there, and we can make sure that they get to the school. Um, and then also I want to highlight a lot of things going on this evening. So, this, so uh, first, I want to talk about the, the U- Grant County Youth Rally. All the churches in Grant County have been invited to the Grant County Youth Rally this Sunday, which will be July 31st at the Splash House from 7 to 9 p.m. So if you, if, if you have youth or no youth that you would like to come, uh, you can, um, you can uh, bring them. Um, there will be a time of fellowship, worship, and hearing the Word of God as, as the youth of Grant County come together. And I also want to say, just because Derek hasn't said it, that, that really Derek was one of the primary initiators of this event. So we're very proud of him for that. Yeah. We're, we're, can embarrass them that way, but but um, so uh, and the other thing I want you to do is, as, as it even says here in the in the newsletter, I want to encourage you to be pr- in prayer for them, because if it's just an event where it's fun and kids come to it, like that's great, that's there's wonderful, there's nothing wrong with that. But we want it to be an event where 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 the spirit of God works and moves, where both there's a, a unity that comes and churches working together, and then also there's uh, you know God is able to speak to kids' lives where they are. So that's our prayer this evening. I invite you to continue to pray in that way. Before that. If that, that is it from 7 to 9. Uh, and at 5 p.m. Uh, here, we're having a, a congregational meeting. Um, you should have received a letter. You should have received an email. And we've been announced for several weeks. Um, an informational meeting regarding the situation of the United Methodist Church and the, the disaffiliation process in which Hanfield has, has now been engaged. So it's going to be kind of the final informational meeting um, at 5 p.m. So you can come with questions. We're going to have a few more, maybe some answers. You know, I mean, uh, we're going to have a few more um, uh, some more information to share, and then also a time to answer questions. And that is in preparation for next Monday. Uh, so it's not on a Sunday. Next Monday, August 8th, is our church conference at which we will have a vote to disaffiliate or not. So um, I invite you to come 
to both of those things, and that will be at 7 p.m., I believe. Is that correct? The meeting next. So 5 p.m. tonight, 7 p.m. next Monday on August 8th. Does that make sense? Save those two dates in your calendar. Make sure you are able to participate in those things. Let's pray together as we begin to worship the Lord. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Um, And I pray, Lord, that as we come to worship you today, that your Holy Spirit would reign and rule in all things that are done, not not just here in worship in this morning, but but in a meeting uh, later today and in the youth rally and, and all these things. Lord, we are desperate for you. We need you. Uh, more than we need air to breathe, more than we need food to eat and water to drink, we need you. And so we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would reign and rule. Lord, would you give us ears that are open to hearing and hearts that are bent towards responding in obedience to everything that you have for us today and every day. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. It's in the mighty name of Jesus I greet you today and proclaim him that Jesus is Lord. And so as we come to this time, uh, we, we, we come to this place and we're expectant of, of some things that take place. But if we need to recalibrate a little piece of it, that's what I want to do with starting things off today. If we've ever just kind of stared at the screen, if we've ever just kind of listened to what's going on around us, I want to re-engage you for worship this morning. I want you to be a full participant in worship this morning. And uh, really, I want all of these songs to be a prayer for all of us to be able to pray. And if those words match up with your prayer, that's great. And if, if you need other words to use, use them. Pray. Pray throughout this whole time as we do this, as we lead into this time. For we want to worship the God of the universe with all of our heart, with everything that we have. So you don't want to leave it by not participating, by letting other people participate, but just kind of being an observer on your own. If you spent any time this week in Mark chapter 14, uh, there's a lot in there, isn't there? Uh, Pastor Derek will be preaching today from really where Jesus comes before the high priest. But before he gets to that place, he goes to a garden. That's the imagery I want you to see today. That's what I want you to consider. And we can even go clear back to the garden that is in Genesis a garden where Jesus wanted to walk with us. That's some imagery you can put in your mind today, where Jesus wanted to come and walk with you and spend time with you. Here in this morning, he wants to do the same with you right now. He wants to minister to you right now. And Jesus left some people there and said, I'm going to go on a little bit further, but I want you to stay here and pray. And he had to go back several times and wake them up. Could you not pray for this hour? So that's why I want to encourage you to do today. Begin to pray. Begin to pray right where you are. You need to take any position you need to take. If you, if you want to stand during worship, you can stand. If you want to sit, you can sit. If you need to come front and kneel, if you want to come to the front row just to change your position, if you need to grab a couple people and start a prayer meeting on the side of the room, you're free to do so during our worship time today. to him right there in your own heart, in your own mind. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, the joys I feel, the bliss we share. Savior shows his face and 
nothing else there if there's something else that keeps interrupting go ahead and give it over to him Heavenly Father we hand this to you all the other attention all the other things that are distracting us whatever else is popping in our mind we turn it over to you so that we can be fully attentive to your work here today let us hear from your spirit.
Not when you choose to continue to be broken and ignore him, but he wants to bind you up. He wants to meet you in that place of prayer and to set you right. But sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it hurts to set those bones. Sometimes it hurts to get those things that are out of place and put them right before the Lord. But we have to do it. We have to say, God, we want your will. And sometimes when we're too proud, God breaks us. So watch out for that too but it's the best place you can be in. Let's celebrate this. So come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that, that never runs dry.
imagine that little space in Genesis where you're waiting for God and it's the cool of the evening and he's going to come in and meet with you. Let that be this place right here. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still Father, indeed, we thank you for those words we've just sung and the ability we have to know you and to walk with you and to talk with you and to, and to experience you along the way. Lord, as we come into this time of prayer, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to speak to us in that way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, I just want to invite you that um, as we come to this time of prayer, as is our custom here at Hanfield, um, if you have a particular need or a burden, uh, a need for prayer in your life, there's something uh, going on that you need uh, some people to come alongside you and pray with you and be lifting up, uh, the, to be lifting you up in prayer for whatever that needs. I just want to invite you to stand where you are and, and, and people can come around you and, and maybe place a hand on your shoulder or just stretch their hands out towards you and be lifting you in prayer for whatever that is. If, if you have a need this morning, would you, would you stand where you are? Father, we, just, we thank you as we've just sung these words of, uh, of the fact that you, we can walk with you. And so it, it, when, we, when we go through the, the seasons of night and the, and the darkest woe, that you, we can walk into those things with you. And that brings us all the peace and comfort and joy. Because as we sung just a few moments before, that it was because of your love that you sent your son Jesus Christ to make a way for us where there was no way to pay a debt that we could not pay. And so, Lord, in, in response, then, we simply give you all that we have, which is ourselves, wholly surrendered to you.
And we give you praise and thanks. That you, looking at our offering for you, which, which pales in comparison to what you've given us, and you receive our offering of ourselves as, as a worthy and worthy sacrifice for you. So we thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, I ask, uh, I ask because we know that you love us, and because of that we have confidence. And so I pray particularly for the needs of this congregation, particularly for those who are standing, who have a, a special need for you, perhaps a burden there for themselves or someone else. And I pray, Lord, that you would begin to work and move, perhaps even in this hour of worship, and, and certainly in the week to come, Lord, we ask you to work and move and show your faithfulness. Lord, we know you're always working. We know that you know our needs. But we, uh, I just ask for an opportunity to see your work. So I pray that whatever the situations for those who are standing, for those who are, who are not standing but wish they had, uh, I pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit and work in a way that only you can. Lord, truly, only you can meet our needs. We, we look to other things. We look to other means. We look to other uh, sources. Uh, and rightfully so, you've given us tools and things. But ultimately, the gifts that, 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 that we have, even for healing and for whatever else, ultimately, the gifts that we use to heal come from you. Come from skills or come from knowledge that comes from you. And so we give you praise and, 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 and great anticipation for what you will do. Lord, as Derek comes to and preach to us in, in, a, in, a little, in a few minutes, I pray that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit in a powerful way. Give him an anointing. Uh, and, and may we be ready to hear what it is that you have to say to us this morning. And not only hear it, but then respond in obedience. Lord, we love you and we trust that these things, all these things to your care. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, today um, we are, uh, we have been, uh, we're going to continue in a time of prayer here for a moment, and, and we're going to continue to do so by, um, uh, we've been in a season, sort of a season of membership, if you will. Uh, we've, we've had several youth that have gone through the confirmation class. If you remember just a couple weeks ago, we had a whole slew of people that had either gone through youth that had gone through confirmation or um, adults who were coming to, to join the church, and we're going to continue that today and um, even into next week as well. So I would invite those who are here who are, um, I saw several of you, um, that are um, either the youth that were being confirmed or that, um, or that were... Uh, adults that were joining, if you'd like to come forward now and join me up here. <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> and you guys were at camp meeting when a lot of the rest of the youth had joined, so. Yeah, everybody else did the other day, so. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so today I present for, uh, for membership, I present uh, Marty Michener and Dean Dawson and Anna Arce. And then for confirmation, we have uh, James Hancock and William Hancock. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to get to know both some people going, coming through, um, going for uh, both the membership class, and spending time with people talking about kind of the history and, and tradition of our church, and then also um, the, for the for the youth, especially hanging out with them uh, for a little bit, and and just uh, we have we have a great group of kids here at Hanfield. Um, the, these just being a sampling of them, we have several more. So great kids. So uh, some questions that we've talked about uh, with all of you. Um, I want to want to ask you some questions, and then I'll have some questions for a question for you all as well. Um, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you: Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say I do. I do. 
Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, I do. And according to the grace given you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's church, holy church and serve as his representatives in the world? If so, say, I will. Yes, I will. Okay. And now, turn the page. And now, do you, as members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, I will. And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, I will. I will. And then to you all who are gathered here, members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect their love. Can you give these folks a round of applause? Thank you. Very good. Okay, you guys can be seated, and let's, let's pray for them as they go. Lord, we thank you for this group of people. I thank you for the commitments that they have already made to you and the commitments they're making to this church kind of in a formal way um, of, of, of committing themselves to this, to this body. And I give you praise for that and pray your anointing on them. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So, oh, at this time, um, the, we're going to pray over our offering, and the children can be dismissed to second half of ministries there. So Miss Shirley is in the back um, waiting for you. Um, you can be dismissed. Let's pray over the offering and over the children as well. Lord, I thank you for all the blessings you've given us, and these children being chief among them. Pray you would fill them with your Holy Spirit today, that you would help them to have ears that are ready to hear and hearts that are open to learning about the things of you. Uh, I give you praise for the work that you have done in them and that you are doing and that you will do. And Lord, we thank you for the offering or for the offering that has been given or that will be given um, and ask that you would help us to be good stewards of that, that we might uh, use that to further your kingdom. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit and to the glory of God the Father. Amen.
Lord, that is our prayer this morning, that we would be guided to your heart. So Spirit, come, be amongst us. Fill this place and fill our lives. We give you praise and thanks for today, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning, we're going to turn to the book of Mark. It's our second to last sermon in our Mark series. We've spent quite a, a while going through this and have taken a couple of breaks. Uh, the, the past couple of weeks, we have not been studying Mark because two Sundays ago was VBS Sunday. And then last Sunday, we had the Dunbars with us giving a missionary update. It was great to meet them and to hear from them and to continue to partner with them in their ministry. So this morning, we're going to pick back up in Mark, and we're going to be in chapter 14, specifically verses 53 through 65. But before we get there, there's a lot going on in the beginning of Mark that's leading up to that point. We're going to take a look uh, at that and see how we get to where we are. So in the beginning of Mark 14, we read the account of Jesus and the woman who pours an expensive jar of perfume onto him. She pours it on his head, and, and some who are there they get really upset with her. And in verses 4 and 5, we read this of Mark 14. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. So those that are around there aren't too happy with this woman and what she's done, but Jesus defends her. He stands up for her and what she's done. Um, saying that you will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me, and she's anointed me in preparation for my burial. But it really doesn't sit well with Judas. In verses 10 and 11, we read this. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them, and they were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Why? Why would Judas be looking for this opportunity to hand him? Like, surely he wasn't that upset about the wasted perfume, right? I mean, not that it even was wasted, but from his perspective, like, like that couldn't have been the thing that pushed him over the edge, right? I mean, it's just a, a bottle of perfume. So, so what is it? What is it that, that causes Judas to go and to do this? Well, uh, this isn't the first time that Jesus actually mentions that I won't always be with you. Jesus talks to them about how he's going to die, how he's going to be handed over, how he's going to suffer. And, and surely, surely that can't be what the Messiah is going to do. Like, like that can't be the Messiah. So there was an understanding among many Jews of that day that the Messiah would be someone who would be a, a military leader, who would come in and, and throw the Romans out of Jerusalem so that, that the capital of God's city could be reestablished and they could have that, the Romans would be out and they would be in control there. So they're looking for a Messiah who's going to kick out the Romans so they can have control of Jerusalem, control of, of, of Israel. And there are many scholars who think that that's kind of what's in Judas's mind when he goes and does this, that he's going to force Jesus's hand, that, that Judas is going and he's trying to make Jesus the kind of Messiah that Judas wants him to be. How many times do we do that? We try to make Jesus who we want him to be. So Judas goes and, and he, he, hands, he goes and agrees to look for an opportunity to hand over Jesus because, well, if the Romans come and arrest Jesus, surely if he's the Messiah, he's not going to stand for that. He's going to rise up then, we're going to rebel, and we're going to take it over if he's really the Messiah. But that's not what Jesus does. And when Jesus doesn't do that, Judas regrets what he's done. He goes back and tries to give back the, the money, tries to give back the silver. He's filled with regret because he's tried to make Jesus who he wants him to be. But we can't do that. We can't make Jesus who we want him to be. We have to allow him to be who he is. But Judas agrees to betray Jesus, and then uh, there's the Last Supper, the, the disciples uh, sleeping in the garden when they should be praying, and Jesus being arrested as his disciples flee. And then we pick up in Mark 14 with verses 53 through 65 where we read this. They, this is a crowd with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests. We read about this in, in verse 43. So that's who the, the they are. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find any. 
Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him and blindfolded him and struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. This is the word of God for the people of God. So Jesus is taken to the the high priest and all the chief priests and teachers of the law. They all come together. And Peter follows at a distance. He, He doesn't want to get too close, but he wants to see what is happening. And did you notice what he does? He sits with the guards and warms himself by the fire. Now, Jesus is arrested at night. We, we know that after they've eaten the supper, after they go to the garden. And, and here it's got to be very late at night, getting cold, and they're sitting by the fire warming themselves. Now, it might not be unusual for someone to be arrested at night. I'd actually think probably more people get arrested at night. That would be my guess. I, I don't know. I don't have much experience in getting arrested or arresting people. But my guess would be that probably more people get arrested at night than than during the day, I would think. But what is unusual, what is strange, is for someone to be taken to the high priest's house at night for a makeshift trial. Because police, that may be a a 24-hour-a-day job, but but the courtroom's open at night? if, we had a judge, if the judge was here, we could ask him, right? Uh, but they're not open in 24 hours for that. They have a set time. And, and, and this isn't even a courtroom that they're going to. It's the high priest's house. They're not going to a public place. They're going to a private resident. So it's an illegal trial. Even during Jesus' time, this is not how trials were to be conducted. It was a secret, unannounced meeting taking place at night, held in a private house. That's not the requirements for the trial. So the Sanhedrin, so we hear about them in the story. The Sanhedrin was an assembly of elders appointed to the uh, tribunal council. So they, would, uh, they could go and uh, would judge people according to the law and what they've done and haven't done. And they would be the ones who would find you guilty or innocent and decide punishments. They were judge, jury, and executioner that came together. And they actually had some guidelines established for how to conduct trials. The first one was no trials after dark. It's not a good time to hold trials at night. Not a good idea. So that was one of their first guidelines. Another one was that they were required to be held in a public venue. Jesus' trial here, they take him to the house of the chief priest, the high priest. It's, It's an illegal trial. They're not even following their own rules on how a trial should be conducted. And what happens here? The Sanhedrin, the ones who have authority to judge... They're the ones who want to find evidence to put Jesus to death. You're in trouble if the people who are judging you have already decided they want to find some evidence to put you to death. But they cannot find any. And why can't they find any? Spoiler alert. There isn't any to be found. They can't find it. They don't know where it is. They, they, don't, they can't find it. So, so people come in and they give false testimony. They, they perjure themselves. They, they lie on the stand. They, they can't even agree on what they're telling. This also violates the, the law of having t- at least two witnesses from the Old Testament. You had to have two witnesses that would see something that would agree on it or else their testimony was thrown out. So it's just another way that this trial was illegal and should have been thrown out. And this leads us to the first of four significant things we see in these verses about the passion of Jesus. Now, when I say the passion of Jesus, you might have heard that phrase phrase before, especially with the movie that came out, The Passion of the Christ. Maybe you've seen that movie. But the passion, sometimes sometimes it's referred to as the last week of Jesus' life, but really more specifically what it means is Jesus' arrest, trial, his suffering, and death. 
That's what the passion of Christ is, the arrest, trial, suffering, and death, and comes from a Latin word that means to suffer or to bear. So when you hear that word term, the passion of Christ, that's what this means. But the first thing here we see about the passion of Christ is trial, arrest, and death is that Jesus was innocent. People who are guilty, uh, do, do, do people who are guilty need an unannounced secret trial that happens at night in a private home? No. No, no, that's not what you need to do for people that you know are guilty. It's people, you need to do that for people that you know are innocent. And the Sanhedrin, they know that Jesus is not guilty. They're looking for evidence against him, but they can't find it, so they try to manufacture it, and that doesn't even work. And then they try to have people lie about it, but they can't even agree on that because Jesus is innocent. Jesus was innocent of any and all sin. He serves as the unblemished lamb. Referencing Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul writes that God made him who had no sin for us to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. In Hebrews 4, 14 and 15, we read, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus suffers and dies innocently. Continuing in Mark 14 with verses 60 through the first part of verse 61, we read, Then the high priest stood up before them and asked, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Now here, from a legal standpoint, if, if TV lawyers are correct, from a legal standpoint, Jesus does the right thing, right? Uh, again, I don't have much experience with lawyers and them giving me advice on what to do, but if you're watching TV, what do the lawyers always tell the clients? Don't say anything. You've already said too much. To remain silent, to not incriminate yourself. So I think from a legal standpoint, Jesus does the right thing here. He remains silent. He, he pleads the fifth, right, essentially. Uh, not that he's going to incriminate himself, but he, he refuses to say anything here. I'm just not going to say anything. He remains silent. And if Jesus remains silent and continues to give no answer, this trial may be over before it even starts. If he just stands there and says nothing, They'd have, they don't have any witnesses that can agree on anything. They're making up lies. They're contradicting themselves. This trial may be over before it starts. But continuing in Mark 14, 61, again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they condemned him all. They all condemned him as worthy of death. And here we see our, our second and third things that are significant about Jesus' passion in these, these verses. First, the, the second thing we see from these verses is that Jesus suffers and dies voluntarily. He could have remained silent. Either here or even maybe in later trials when he appears before Pilate, if he remains silent, even then he might go free. But that was not his plan and it was not God's plan. Jesus suffers and dies voluntarily. No one makes him, no one forces him. Even though there's some people who think they're in charge, who, like the Sanhedrin, they're the one who thinks they're making the decisions, but they're really not. There are other people in the story, too, who think they're making decisions or are in charge. We see this most clearly in John 19, verses 9 through 12, when Pilate goes back in to the residence and speaks with Jesus. And he says, where are you from? And Jesus didn't answer. So Pilate said, you won't speak to me? Don't you know that I have authority to release you or to crucify you? Pilate thinks he's got some authority here. He thinks he's got some power. But Jesus replied, 
You would have no authority over me if it had not been given to you from above. That's why the one who handed me over to you has a greater sin. And from that moment on, Pilate wanted to release Jesus. Those around Jesus here think that they are in control. They think that they are the ones with power and authority. But actually, Jesus is the one who's in control. And he has decided to willingly suffer and die. When Jesus is arrested, he could have, he, the, 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 some of the disciples, they go to rebel and there's an ear cut off. But Jesus says, no, if I wanted this to all be over, I could call down legions of angels right now and it could all be over. But instead, Jesus decides to willingly, voluntarily suffer and die for you and for me, for everyone. The third thing that we see about Jesus' passion from this passage in Mark 14 comes from verse 62. He says, I am, I am, Jesus said, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, Son of Man is a title that Jesus uses to refer to himself as as the Messiah. It's the title he most uses. It's a reference to the Messiah from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, and Jesus uses that to refer to to himself as the Messiah. So he says here, they know what he means here, that, that he, the Son of Man, you'll see him sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One coming in the clouds of heaven. So not only is Jesus the one in control, but we see here that the suffering and death of Jesus will not be the end of Jesus. You're going to see me sitting there and you're going to see me return. Jesus will not end with his death, but his death and suffering is a part of God's plan. Jesus' death is meaningful. He doesn't die for no reason. And even in death, Jesus has purpose to take our sins upon him. So God has a plan and Jesus' death has meaning. It's a part of God's plan. Jesus dies meaningfully to take your sin upon himself as part of God's plan. And death will not and does not have the final word. Continuing to Mark 14, verses 64 and 65, they condemned him as worthy of death, and some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Here we see that after Jesus is condemned to death, he is blindfolded and punched. He is beaten. And this is just the start of the pain and torture that he will endure before he dies. And this is the fourth significant thing about Jesus' passion from these verses. Jesus truly suffered. His suffering and death were real. They were not imagined. They were not fake. He didn't go out of body some way. He he really felt these things and experienced these things. Jesus' death was real. He didn't faint. He didn't pass out. No, he was dead, medically dead. But why is that important, that Jesus actually truly suffered and died? Why is that important? Well, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. In the Old Testament, there's the animal sacrifice system that's established for, for forgiveness. But here, Jesus becomes the once and for all sacrifice, giving himself as the perfect, unblemished lamb. So if Jesus had not died, uh, he would not have paid the price for our sins. He couldn't have just merely passed out or fainted. or No, he, he truly suffered, truly died. So in Mark 14, verses 53 through 65, we see these four theological truths about Jesus' passion. That Jesus suffers innocently. He was innocent of all sin the unblemished lamb. That Jesus suffered voluntarily. He was not a a, a passive victim. He willingly laid down his life for others. And he suffered meaningfully. Christ's suffering and death were a part of God's plan and a part that Jesus submitted himself to. A part of God's plan Jesus was submissive to. We see that in the garden account. Not my will, but your will. And Jesus truly suffered. Christ's sufferings and death were real. If they were not, there was no satisfaction for the penalty of sin, for the wages of sin is death. And Jesus takes that payment for us. 
He pays those wages for us. But what does this matter? What difference does this make to the way that we are living our daily lives? First of all, we see the love of Jesus, the love that Jesus has for you in an amazing way in this passage. He was innocent, yet he voluntarily, meaningfully, and truly suffered and died for you. That's how much he loves you. So when you don't feel good enough, when you don't feel wanted, when you don't feel pretty enough or strong enough, or or when you don't feel like you're enough of whatever it may be, from Jesus' perspective, you, you are loved so much that he was willing to die for you. Jesus says that you are enough. You are enough for me to die for. And he does. And in turn... We should love him. And we can love him because he has first loved us. Love so amazing where Jesus gave his all demands that we too give our hearts, our lives, our all in response to him. I don't know if you've noticed this, but Brad said something similar in the the call to worship. Curtis prayed something similar. And here I've had this written down since this week, and we're not that good. We didn't come together to plan that. But each one of us here today has said that that may we give our all for Jesus because he has given his all for us. Is that you today? Loving Jesus fully and completely. Following him and living for him. If not, make today that day. Also, we know that in the suffering and death of Jesus, God was in control and had a plan. And that Jesus, defeated death, is still alive and will return again. Death does not have the final say. God's plan is still in place. Jesus is alive and one day he will return. Are you ready? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we give you thanks. We give you thanks for Jesus, that you sent him to to die in our place. And Jesus, we praise you this morning that even though you were innocent, you willingly, truly suffered and died for us. In return, Lord, may we offer all of us to you. So whatever it may be this morning that may be holding us back or maybe distracting us or whatever it may be, Lord, may you give us the strength to surrender it to you so that we can give you our all as you have given your all for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today know that Jesus innocently, voluntarily, meaningfully, and truly suffered for you. How will you respond? sing that again. I know you're able and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. I know the sorrow. Yeah.
is well with my soul. It is well. It is. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Jesus gave his all for you. And as you leave here today, give your all for him. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.